Thank you very much. Um, can I just take this opportunity to welcome everyone um, here this afternoon to this service of thanksgiving for the life of George Parks. I know a number have traveled quite a distance um, this afternoon, and we do hope that everyone together in this building feels very, very welcome. Thank you for coming this afternoon. Your presence here today reflects the deep, deep affection that George was held in. And on behalf of the fellowship that meets here at Bethany, we would like to express our deepest sympathy to Elizabeth, to Rowan, Fiona, and Cheryl, also Janet, Philip, and Peter, to all the grand and great-grandchildren, and his sisters Helen and Irene. Indeed, all who knew and loved George. Professor Parks has long been a long-standing member of the Bethany Fellowship, and he's been fully involved in this church, not least as an elder and trustee for many years. It's difficult to articulate the deep affection and love that our brother was held in. A brilliant surgeon and an accomplished medical educator, an academic and president of the Royal College of Surgeons in Ireland, but above all, a loving husband, father, and committed Christian. He was a humble and gentle man. His contribution to Bethany is an investment in the lives of Christians cannot be overstated, and we shall miss him greatly. The last months have been so difficult for Elizabeth and the family, but they've borne this with such devotion and care. However, for all the sadness, and Elizabeth and the family will feel it deeply, George would want to remind us and everyone here that his true home was always heaven, and to there he has most assuredly gone. And in this today, we can rejoice. I'm going to ask you to stand in a minute just to sing our opening hymn, In Christ Alone. I will then ask um, Clifford Tune just to come on up and, and to pray, uh, a fellow elder at the church in times past and a great friend of George. And then Rowan will come up and pay a family tribute. So could we all please rise to sing, In Christ Alone.
And before we open in prayer, I have been asked to say just a few words. In uh, John's Gospel, the eighth chapter, we read these words. When Jesus spoke to the people, he said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. In early life, George made a decision which would be to be just such a follower of Jesus. And that would be the distinctive and defining characteristic for the rest of his life, walking and serving Jesus Christ, his Lord, in a day-to-day living relationship. For Christianity is not so much a religion, really, but a relationship with Jesus. And just as doctors have their uniform, their, whether it be a white coat or the scrubs, so the Christian has a prescribed wardrobe. And writing to the Christians who were in the church at Colossae, the Apostle Paul said this. He said, As God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with, and then he lists five items, compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. And if you knew George, then you would know that all these were well-worn inner vestments, for each of them would characterize George's life of service in all its phases. I'm delighted to see the photograph which is on the, the order of service. It gives us a delightful remembrance of George just as he was. Uh, not in formal academic gown, so as we might be remembering today as Professor Parks, although of course there is a place for that, to remember him as a talented surgeon and the gifted scholar. But today, as we mourn his loss, and sorrow with his family. We remember George as a much-loved friend, and we give thanks to God for his life of service and influence for good, which was really nothing but the outpouring of his love for God. I've known George for, I reckon it's over 60 years, both as a loyal friend and then also as a neighbor for many years. And indeed, such was his kindness and humility that uh, for quite some time he enlisted himself as chauffeur to my daughters on the school run. That was George. Nothing was too small for him to do. But more importantly, I valued his friendship as a fellow member with the Christians who meet here, and many of whom are present today also grieving his loss. For much of those 60 years, as we have heard from Jeff, George took an active part in the leadership and the direction of this fellowship as both an elder and as church secretary. And I can put it really no better than quote what Alan Bronte, the church secretary of today, which he wrote elsewhere. He said, George achieved an extraordinary balance between his professional life, his family life, and in his care for the church. He applied his wisdom, his encouragement, his kindness, his generosity, often, in fact, always, almost always with good humor and in the most humble and gentle manner. He loved his Lord and he loved, his God, God, he loved God's word. We'll all miss him greatly as we would seek to follow his example. So wrote Alan, and I think we would all say amen to that. I would add that he invariably displayed a quiet, unflappable manner, even when matters being discussed might have caused emotion to get a little bit high. George would remain unflustered, calm, composed, and ready to step in with sound counsel. And like it is written of King David in Psalm 78, he led his people with skillful hands and with integrity of heart. There were four simple lines written by the poet, excuse me, by the poet Philip Larkin at the time of the late Queen Elizabeth II's Silver Jubilee in 1977. She was presented with an urn and Larkin had written these four simple lines. Now to understand them you have to remember the context 
was after 25 years of momentous change in Britain, both economically, socially, and culturally. And often in that time, there was serious civil unrest. And this is what Larkin wrote. In times when nothing stood but worsened or grew strange, there was one constant good. She did not change. And such was the influence of George Park's life, and we thank God for it. Constant, stable, steadfast, dependable, true, and so much valued in these challenging and ever-changing times. I've said nothing of George's professional life in medicine. That wasn't part of my brief, but you only have to, see, to Google his name and the achievements, awards, and distinctions just come tumbling out. But in closing, I would uh, just add this, if I may. Earlier this year, I had reason to visit a uh, professional, a consultant a surgeon, uh, who was hitherto unknown to me. And uh, although I'm getting on a bit, and I'm not wet behind the ears entirely, uh, I was slightly apprehensive about what was involved, and so I casually asked the surgeon uh, if he had ever known or come across Rowan Parks. Uh, the way he glanced at me, I knew I had made my point. Uh, <laughs> uh, only in passing, he said, he was quite a bit senior to me. Uh, and then he added, at my final surgery examinations, my examiner happened to be his father. And that was all I needed to, knew, to know. <laughs> I knew I was in safe hands. Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, we would come into your presence in the worthy name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we would acknowledge you as our creator and the sustainer of our lives and would come to give you our praise and our worship this afternoon. We thank you for our Lord Jesus Christ, for his blood that was shed and his redeeming work upon the cross, for the pardon and forgiveness of sins which he offers freely to all who will turn to him, and for your love, which covers all who will receive it, leading us upward and onward with hope and anticipation to our glorious rest above. We would pray for your presence and blessing upon this gathering, that you may be honored as we would celebrate and give thanks for a life which glorified you. We would pray for George's wife, Elizabeth, for Rowan, Fiona and Cheryl, together with each member of the family who has sustained this great loss, and for all who mourn today. May each Father find lasting comfort in your arms of love and in that peace which alone comes from you. We give thanks for the life, the long life, of George Parks. We celebrate in your name all that he achieved for the kingdom of God and the rich legacy which he has left us today. We thank you that he touched so many lives with his friendship and the light and joy of his faith in Jesus. And we rejoice today that his soul has departed to be with Christ, which, which scripture assures us is a state far better. Thank you for that sure and certain hope. And as this service of thanksgiving and remembrance proceeds, we ask that you would be with all who take part, and may all be done for your honour and glory. For it is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, thank you, Clifford. And firstly, may I, on behalf of the family, add my welcome um, on top of Jeff's to all, not just here in the, the main auditorium, to those sitting uh, 
in our side room, to those upstairs, not sure if this is the right camera, but also to those who are perhaps streaming and, and watching online. As a family, we want to thank you for being here, for joining us, for all your kind messages and thoughts over these last few days, indeed weeks and months. Thank you. It's really meant a lot. So, Dad, Thomas George Parks, born on the 14th of June, 1935, to Christopher and Evelyn Parks, the youngest of seven children. Dad had two older brothers and four older sisters. He was born in Ardmore, Derryad, on the shores of Loch Ney, and grew up on the family farm. Schooling was in a little primary school, a little country primary school, um, and then he went off to Lurgan Technical, Lurgan Technical College. He initially studied engineering. I don't know if you knew that, but he studied engineering um, between 14 years of age when he left the school to 16. And after that, he started an apprenticeship in construction with McLaughlin and Harvey. Throughout his life, Dad always enjoyed a bit of DIY. He was never a man for shopping, never liked going to the shops, but his favorite shop where he did go and could spend hours was B&Q. Many a birthday present or Christmas present was some new gadget that he had found in B&Q. And I, was, no, I know that he was delighted when one of his grandchildren, Thomas, uh, showed such an interest in DIY and indeed is now working for B&Q. I think Grando was a little bit jealous of that. <laughs> However, construction and DIY became Dad's hobby rather than his occupation. And he made a decision in his late teens to study medicine, but he didn't have the right qualifications. He didn't have his Latin. So he had to go to night classes and study and achieve the grades in, in Latin before he applied to do medicine. But he achieved the grades and in 1953 moved to the big smoke of Belfast, the first of the family to move from the country to Belfast, and he studied medicine at Queen's. He won scholarships and prizes in every year as an undergraduate and qualified as a doctor in 1959 before joining the staff as a house officer at the Royal Victoria Hospital. Now, it is hard, Clifford, to summarize a stellar professional career, but I'll try. Dad undertook his uh, postgraduate training in Belfast. He passed his fellowship of the Royal College of Surgeons of Edinburgh, Laura, uh, in 1963. And interestingly, only became a fellow of the Royal College of Surgeons in Ireland 20 years later. A period of research led to the ward of an MCH a Master's of Surgery for a Thesis on Diverticular Disease. Some of you might know what that is. It's in the bowels. This was seminal work at the time, and his publications are still quoted 50 years later. As a senior registrar, he moved to London to work at St. Mark's Hospital in the Royal London Hospital, Whitechapel. And here he further developed his specialist interest in bowel surgery. Coming back to Belfast, he was appointed as a senior lecturer at Queen's and honorary consultant surgeon, both in the Belfast city and in the Royal Victoria Hospital, setting up Northern Ireland's first specialist colorectal unit. And over the following three decades, he contributed significantly to his specialist clinical practice. He established a large research portfolio and had major inputs to undergraduate teaching and also postgraduate education and training. This was recognized by being promoted to Professor of Surgical Sciences in 1982. For 20 years, Dad was the central figure of surgical training in Northern Ireland, chairing recruitment panels, organizing SHO and registrar rotations, being specialty advisor to the Northern Ireland Council for Postgraduate Medical and Dental Education, and also specialist advisor to the Royal College of Surgeons in Edinburgh and to the Royal College of Surgeons in Ireland. And he only had to stand down all this activity and his interest when I came along as a junior surgical trainee. He had to get off all the panels 
uh, and whatnot for obvious reasons. Dad was also a very respected examiner, both at undergraduate and postgraduate levels. He examined at Queen's for several other universities in Great Britain and throughout Ireland and also internationally, as well as for all the postgraduate fellowship examinations of all four of the surgical royal colleges. He traveled all over the world. And I'm reliably told by our recently retired senior college officer in Edinburgh that he was always first to arrive for the exams, treated the candidates politely and with respect, and was one of the last to depart after leaving all his pencils, his rubber, sharpener, and score sheets immaculately positioned on the table. Perhaps what Dad will be remembered for uh, most professionally was his commitment to and his involvement with specialist associations and the Royal Colleges. He was president of the Ulster Society of Gastroenterology, the Irish Society of Gastroenterology, the section of proctology of the Royal uh, Society of Medicine, the Irish Association of Coloproctology, St. Mark's Association, the Association of Coloproctology of Great Britain and Ireland, and the Association of Surgeons of Great Britain and Ireland. But Dad became a member of the Royal College of Surgeons in Ireland in 1983. And this was to provide an opening for what would be his most cherished contribution to surgical practice. The Irish College meant the world to him. And the relationships, friendships that he and mum enjoyed over 40 years were very special. He was elected to council in 1986, served on and chaired many of the standing committees and then was elected vice president and president. He's only the fourth president from Northern Ireland in the college's 239 year history. I think he knew the road between Belfast and Dublin like the back of his hand, including every bypass and shortcut. He traveled that route weekly by car for almost 16 years. And even after he finished his formal role with the college, he and mum took every opportunity to go back to Dublin never missing an opportunity. Functions, dinners, events, meetings, he still went to everything he could. And how lovely it is to see so many representing the college today. But what about Dad? Dad was a friendly man. Dad was a friend to many, many people. He was approachable, warm, engaging, and interested in people. Whether it was a student, a house officer on their first day, a research fellow, an international medical graduate or a consultant colleague, Dad was always interested in them. And he had friends at work, church, all over the world. What's been lovely over the last few days has been reading the comments from many of the messages that we have received. He was described as a kind, considerate, and charming man. Kind and generous to all he came in contact with. The epitome of a professional gentleman, a mentor, a lovely man, an inspiration, a leader, a rule model, a remarkable, humble man, a wonderful man and a fine ambassador for surgery. One of his consultant colleagues wrote, and I quote, and this is testament to Dad's character, we worked together and shared an office for many, many years and never even had the most minor of disagreements. Dad was a friendly man to everyone. Dad was a family man. I'm going to have my F's, three F's. Dad was a family man. Whilst Dad's work and vocation was important to him, there were two things that meant even more to him than his professional uh, uh, career. One was his family, and the other was his faith. He respected and loved his parents and his siblings. And as the youngest child, he was well looked, over, uh, looked after by his older brothers and sisters, and I suspect spoilt at times, you know, the youngest child syndrome. <laughs> I think he did get up to some mischief and nonsense as a child, but I couldn't get anything out of his two surviving sisters to, to spill the beans on. They just thought the world of him. 
Dad was born in the 1930s, and the family farmhouse initially had no electricity and had an outside toilet. All the park's children walked to and from Ardmore School, which was about half a mile away. They had fun when they came home from school back on the farm. They went out, played ball games outside in the afternoon. And the evenings, it was puzzles and cards and uh, no electricity, so they had the tilly lamps in the rooms. So life was simple, uncomplicated, but a lot of fun. Dad was recognized as being very bright and very sharp from a young age, and he had always had a quick and wicked sense of humor, even as a child. When he was five, and that was before he started school, as school starting age was six in those days, but when he was five, the family had a visiting preacher staying with them. The man was a Mr. Forster, a retired commissioner of Belfast Harbor. And Mr. Foster, in conversation, said that it was going to be his birthday, and he would be 69. And at Dad, my father, as quick as a flash, turned and said, I thought you were going to be 70. Added a year on. When Dad moved up to the big smoke in Belfast, he made lots of new friends. David Graham, Des Hall, George Johnson, and their other halves. And these friendships would last for life. But there was one friendship that would develop that was a bit more special. Elizabeth Mahood was a staff nurse at the Royal Victoria, and that friendship developed into a romance, an engagement, and subsequently marriage on the 18th of March, 1964, 59 years ago. Three children appeared, firstly myself, then Fiona and Cheryl. Mum and Dad's first home was at, uh, in Greystown Avenue, which is about a stone's throw from here. But from April 1967 to September 1968, they moved to London. I was the only one around to enjoy that adventure at the time. And although I was only one and had no specific memories, there were lots of photographs from that time. And we had plenty of visitors, such as my Uncle David and Auntie Iris. But returning to Belfast... The next house was a new build in Malone View Road. Dad took great interest in the design, and the fitting out of what was to be the family home for about 35 years, with various modifications and extensions over the year. But before they left to go to London, Mum and Dad had put all their possessions and all their furniture into storage. Unfortunately, when we were away, that storage unit had a major fire and they lost everything. So in returning to Belfast, they had to, to furnish that new home from scratch. As you heard from Clifford, schooling for us, well, for me, it was at Minch, Inch Marlow and then Belfast Inns. The girls, they went to Victoria. And Dad's role and job was to take us to school every day, with or without some of the tune kids. And the only time that didn't happen, really, was uh, when they was away traveling, examining or whatever. And on that occasion... Clifford often took us, so that was lovely too. Um, Or else we went to stay with the Johnson family or some of the other families uh, that we knew when mum was traveling also. These were great days, and although dad was working hard, he supported us for school events, sports activities, when he could. Dad didn't take many holidays throughout the year and often worked over Christmas and bank holidays. And indeed, in those days, Saturday morning was also a regular part of of the working week. But when the month of July came, Dad always somehow managed to take the whole month off, usually typically about four weeks, and this was holiday time. The formula for many years was to go camping in Europe, never in Northern Ireland or the United Kingdom, as the weather was too unpredictable. But just getting onto the continent and heading south until we found the sunshine. Now, let me paint you a picture. My memories are of the family car which was a large Datsun estate or a station wagon. Dad managed to source and get a roof rack that's suitable for a Ford Transit van. Okay, and he had the feet and the attachment of this amended so that it fitted on top of this estate car. Did overhang a bit, massive big roof rack. The the large boot of the car was for food and provisions to last a month. So with tins, drinks, cereals, supplies of all sorts, And then in this roof rack, there was a tent, a six-man tent with all the pools, the canvas, suitcases, bags, boxes, all piled high. 
on this Ford Transit roof rack. And then Dad had a tarpaulin specially manufactured to go over anything. You know, like what you get on a lorry um, with straps and ties, piled high. And then on top of that would go the boat. <laughs> because in holidays, we always had to find water for me to go pottering around in a wee boat. Now, this wasn't a rubber dinghy, but a solid plastic eight-foot boat, an outboard engine. So it overhung the front and the back a bit as well as out the sides. We never toppled over, but we did have to empty the boot on at least one occasion to change a wheel by the side of the road. Typically, we went Lawrence to Nour, dove around England, Dover, Calais, into France, and then generally headed south. But we also went to Germany, Austria, Switzerland, Italy, Spain, stopping randomly at Canstites and staying a few days before moving on. Great family times, great family memories. Now, you remember, this was the days before sat-nav, before mobile phones, before air conditioning. So it was maps, open windows, plenty of fresh air. But those were happy days. For many years, it was just our own family. But then there were other families from this church who also did European holidays. But they were the caravanning club. <laughs> the Currys, McClellans, Sullivans. And a few occasions, we all met up and traveled together. Now, one of the challenges when we traveled in convoy was that each of the families and each of the cars had to take their turn at being the lead car and doing the navigating with maps. Now, one year, there were three towing caravans and the parks with an estate car, big roof rack, and tent. And I recall once when we were at the tail of the convoy and we were negotiating our way around Paris. And somehow we got into a built-up housing area there was the lead car and caravan, two other cars and caravan, and we were at the back. We were going through this um, built-up area and managed to drive down a cul-de-sac. <laughs> what a laugh. Now, we easily reversed out and turned and got pointed in the right direction, but I think it took about an hour for the <laughs> caravans to get back out and pointing in the right hour direction. But what fun. The other bit of fun was when we arrived at a campsite to see who could get set up first and get to the swimming pool. Now, the parks were very slick. We had all our jobs to do. We had our routine to get the tent frame up, the canvas on, the airbeds blown up, the sleeping bags installed, and everyone had their job. Mum, Dad, myself, Fiona and Cheryl, we all knew what to do, and we all did it simultaneously. And I believe that on most occasions, we could be set up before the caravanning club had all their manoeuvring, their positioning, their leveling, their connections all plugged in. Book days, great fun. Dad was a great father, caring, supportive, and generous. And as Fiona, Cheryl, and I passed school age, moved on, started working, getting married, etc., he was an enormous help to us in so many ways, always interested and what we were doing, organizing and planning our weddings, practically helping us find and finance our first homes, and always interested in our friends and the wider networks. Then came the grandchildren, Matthew, Amy, Naomi, and Thomas, Ben, Megan, and Caitlin, and the great-grandchildren, Lucy and Emily. Dad was a fabulous grandfather and great-grandfather, and he was special and meant so much to each of them. Always wanting to mark special events, he loved birthday celebrations, anniversary, Christmas time, and any excuse for a get-together and a party. But one very significant memory and holiday was to celebrate Mum and Dad's uh, golden wedding anniversary. All the family, Mum and Dad, the three of us as children, our other halves, seven grandchildren, 15 in total, spent the most fabulous week on a Caribbean cruise organized to perfection and to the very minutest of detail by Dad, who was the chief tour guide, ably supported by Mum, director of operations. <laughs> we had a wonderful holiday and great memories, memories that will last with all of us. But it was all about family and fun times together. Dad was a, a friendly man. Dad was a family man. Dad was a friendly man. But Dad was also, thirdly and lastly, a man of faith. Few who knew Dad will know 
They will not know, sorry, that he had a strong Christian faith. As a teenager, he made a decision, a life-changing decision to commit his life and his future to God. Although he had grown up in a Christian home with Christian parents, and although throughout his childhood he attended Ardmore Gospel Hall, it was a very personal decision that influenced and impacted the rest of his life and also his future life now that he has left his physical body. Every decision he considered, every choice he made, was guided by his faith and trust in God. The decision to pursue a medical career, to date and marry mum, to live and work in Belfast, to be involved in this church and fellowship that meets here for almost 60 years, was guided by his faith and trust in God. As you've heard from Clifford, mum and dad have been members of this church since they were married and returned from their honeymoon. They were actually formally welcomed as members of this church twice. The first week after returning from honeymoon, they were introduced as Mr. and Mrs. Mahood. That's mum's maiden name. So that had to be corrected in the following week. They were welcomed again as Mr. and Mrs. Parks. Mum and Dad brought us as children to this church and at home lived out their Christian faith as an example to each of us. Again, as you've heard from Clifford, he was involved in the leadership um, and as an elder in this church for, I think, about 40 years. And he's been extremely faithful attending, even driving up after council meetings at the college in Dublin to get to a midweek evening meeting. He also made every effort to get to church on a Sunday morning, even if he was on call at weekends. He would go in very early on a Sunday morning uh, to do a ward round, see his patients, and then race up the Lisburn Road to get here for starting time. And I recall one Sunday morning being here, um, probably in the foyer area, and somebody came over and said, I've just passed your dad, pulled in at the side of the road with a police car and blue flashing light behind him. Such was his commitment to being at church. However, on that occasion, on that occasion, with, a, with his smile, explanation of who he was and where he was going, he was let on his way and calmly walked into church unperturbed. <laughs> we will remember Dad as a friendly man who enjoyed fun and laughter, a devoted family man who was loved by all, but ultimately a man of faith. Thank you very much, Rowan, for that very fitting uh, tribute. Thank you so much. Um, before uh, we just sing our next um, hymn, um, I'm just going to say that David Emerson will come up and do a reading after we sing the hymn, and then Ian McCorkle uh, here at the front will bring us a message. So can I ask you just to stand, please, for our next hymn, The Lord's My Shepherd. Thank you.
Our scripture reading is from the first epistle of Peter, chapter 1, verses 3 to 9. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy he hath given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil or fade. This inheritance is kept in heaven for you, who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. In all this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. These have come so that the proven genuineness of your faith of greater worth than gold, which perisheth even though refined by fire, may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Though you have not seen him, you love him, and even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy, for you are receiving the end result of your faith, the salvation of your soul. Thank you. Thank you, David. It's my privilege to be asked to uh, take part this morning, or this this afternoon. Um, A privilege for me to be here and to say on behalf of our family and again on behalf of this church, our love and sympathy for you as a family. Um, I can't compete with either Rowan or Clifford Um, Clifford has known George for more than 60 years. Rowan almost has known him for 60 years. Um, I can only manage just over 40. Um, Whenever I came to around this church a little bit as a a young law student, um, the great Professor Parks was here. And then a couple of years after that, I got to know Rowan. And uh, George was very kind um, and, and viewed me benignly even though doubtless I was viewed as a bad influence on on Rowan. Um, Some of us tried to be a bad influence on Rowan and generally failed, which was a a disappointment. Uh, But um, George was was very kind and Elizabeth. um, And indeed, then whenever uh, I I decided to join this church in 1987, George was the approachable person that I went to and to talk about joining this church and his encouragement his welcome uh, was something that we, we've heard a lot about today. Um, I want to talk to you a little bit from the, the letter that St. Paul wrote to people in Thessalonica, 1 Thessalonians 1. Um, at the graveside yesterday, uh, as the family buried George, uh, Henry Coulter uh, gave a, a little message, and uh, Henry started to speak from 1 Thessalonians 1. So there's this slightly sinking feeling, he's going to steal my sermon. Um, But uh, Henry kindly used some of the points and then moved off, so I've still got a little bit of room, and I'll not keep you too long. But it's interesting that both Henry and the family, as they talked about George, and as I reflected and prayed about what to speak about, I think that's the bottles from next door, um, uh, as we, we both reflected on what might be appropriate to talk about, our minds went to uh, verses in 1 Thessalonians 1. You'll maybe get the idea as I read some of the verses. Verse 2, we always thank God for all of you, mentioning you in our prayers. We continually remember before God and Father, listen to these words, your work produced by faith, your labor prompted by love, and your endurance inspired by hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. Interesting that our sense was that these words from Scripture that St. Paul uses talking about the church in Thessalonians, we both felt appropriate to steal and apply to George. Your work produced by faith, your labor prompted by love, and your endurance inspired by hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. Faith, hope, and love But I want to reflect a little bit on on what it is that the Apostle is talking about, work produced by faith. 
We've had it touched on already as we have reflected on George's professional life, his family life, and indeed his church life. One of the things that was inspiring was that for George, these didn't seem to be in heavy contradiction. It's very easy for us to try and compartmentalize or indeed to compartmentalize different elements of our life so that our, our professional life is in, contact, in conflict with our family life and our faith life seems separate and in a little glass box. For George Parks, there was the weaving of those together in a way which was quite remarkable. He saw his work as an expression of his faith. He saw his family life as an expression of his faith. All of those were blended together. As I reflected on that, that was one of the reasons that George stood out as, a, as an example, and I'm going to come to that in a moment, because those lives were held, as other people have already said, in a remarkable balance. Doubtless, there were the challenges, but George put the effort in to make it work. Work produced by faith. St. Paul then talks about labor prompted by love. The, the, the Greek word that's used labor here is, is the idea of, of toil that produces weariness, you know, a, a, a real effort. Labor prompted by love. Again, as we have heard the tributes that have been paid already, something of that expression of love, of care, of gentleness, of patience was what came through in terms of George's life. Rowan quoted some of the quotations that people had shared. Um, I did a bit of stealing from Facebook as well, Rowan. Um, and uh, one of the, 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 the phrases was, an amazing man who was always an encourager. Your dad was such a gentle and humble man. He has left an amazing legacy. One doctor um, who at the time said that he had had a, a little bit of contact with him uh, said that despite, in a sense, the difference in seniority, he treated me with genuine interest. Labor prompted by love. In his professional life, caring. It always bemused me that on Christmas Day, the Parks family didn't just have time together as a family, but they all traipsed up to the hospital first thing in the morning. It sounded horrific to me. But it was an expression of where, again, that blend of George's professional life, work life, family life, where, they, where he wanted to be there with his patients on his ward, with his colleagues who had drawn the short straw doubtless for the, for the shift. The Parks family went en masse up to the hospital to show their commitment. Labor prompted by love, a true compassion. And indeed, as we reflected in this church on his life, it was the same love and care that came through. I mentioned that I got to know him in the early 80s, and then when Heather and I were getting married in 1989, it was him that we went to uh, as the person who was going to marry us, and he married us in the, in, the, in the church building that was situated on this spot. Now, it caused a bit of gentle amusement to me that when people said, oh, oh, Professor George Parks, is he the minister? And I took some pleasure in saying, no, he's a proctologist. <laughs> now, the non-medical among you can Google that later. But for George, he was that gentle, approachable person that walked the journey with us of life. And indeed, as life went on, it was my privilege um, to, to then work with him in church life. Um, at times, he would, we would go on visiting together. He would drive us in, the, in whatever uh, Jaguar he had at that time, um, which was at times a slightly frightening experience. So the, <laughs> the idea of the trip to the south of France, um, uh, maybe that was a, a, an exercise in prayer life. Um, but uh, George was, a, was an amazing elder and leader of this church fellowship. Again, in that, he was a role model. Um, again, I want, to, I want to borrow again from, from what uh, St. Paul writes here, because just not only the verses that we read, but I want to read some phrases on down the passage. Because Paul talks about, he says, our gospel came to you, 
not simply with words, but also with power, with the Holy Spirit, and with deep conviction. Not only with words, but with power and deep conviction. George Parks was a man of authenticity, deep conviction. His faith shone through all that he did. Uh, Again, St. Paul goes on to say, you know how we lived among you for your sake. You became imitators of us and the Lord. In despite of severe suffering, you welcomed the message. And so you became a model to all the believers in Macedonia and Asia. The Lord's message rang out from you, not only in Macedonia and Achaia. Your faith in God has become known everywhere. Therefore, we don't need to say anything about it, for they themselves report what kind of reception you give us. Phrases uh, uh, that we're adopting, that Paul adopted as he described their life of authenticity among those believers. Deep conviction, worthy of imitation, as these men imitated Christ. George Parks was an imitator of Christ, and those of us who had any sense knew that it was worth imitating him. And so he became a model to believers. Again, interesting, going back to the Facebook comments, he was an absolute gentleman, a wonderful example of lived-out faith a great man who has set such a fine example. Always a gentleman and an example to us all. A fine ambassador for surgery, not just in Northern Ireland, but internationally. Isn't it remarkable that that echo came through of someone who was an example, who was a role model? But I want to suggest to you that part of that, and and indeed a major part of that, was because George Parks modeled himself on Christ, as Clifford reminded us. And so, work produced by faith, labor prompted by love, endurance inspired by hope. Again, as time went on, uh, George's uh, life uh, changed and so on, and as he stepped back from his professional life, more time was able to be spent with the family. Again, I should say that he was very kind and accepted that uh, I might be a bad influence on Fiona and Cheryl as, they, as, they, as I worked with them. Um, and, uh, but often uh, we, we, we talked. And I remember asking him, you know, do you not miss um, the, you know, the surgery? Um, and he said, well, I, I don't miss it because I still keep contact with my colleagues. And, he, and as Rona said, he loved the, the, the Dublin College and, and involved. But there was very much a sense of calling of, of stages of life. And as uh, George got older, um, he, invest, he kept investing in the young people. Again, I think a remarkable testimony that yesterday uh, at the grave, um, rather than I was going to say some old preacher, but maybe you'll view me as some old preacher. Um, Rather than some preacher at the grave, it was young men from this fellowship that George and Elizabeth wanted to be there and the family wanted to be there to take part. A man who cared for young people. The Professor Parks that we know and have heard about in this church was not overly known as Professor Parks. He was known as George. And that was the reality of a man, humble, gentle, investing in people, loving people, serving them. Why? Because his hope and his security was in Jesus Christ. As I reflect on that little phrase, your endurance inspired by hope. Christian hope is is a certain expectation We've been told already how George came to faith at a young age, and that shaped his life. Well, again, while we can reflect on George as a, as a remarkable example, the example that he set was not simply of a remarkable surgeon, was not simply of a remarkable gentleman, and both of those he was, but as a man of faith, What does that mean? Well, in this passage, it tells us something about the faith that 
uh, George and others have. Read right at the end of the, the little section in 1 Thessalonians, it says, they tell how you turn to God from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, who rescues us from coming wrath. That's, in a nutshell, something of the gospel, a turning to God from stuff, from our own ambition, our own uh, attempt to, to get right with God, a turning to God to serve the living and true God. That was George's choice. And with an expectation to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus. This morning, or this afternoon, we celebrate resurrection. As we reflect on George's body laid to rest in Lambeg yesterday, his earthly remains are laid to rest. As Christians, we believe that the Scripture says that he is absent from the body, present with the Lord. He enjoys the present reality of the presence of his Lord and Savior. But it doesn't stop there. The family chose a reading from Revelation 21 to be read at the grave yesterday. And it was a massive encouragement to me as I reflected on what I wanted to say at the close today. Because Revelation 21 talks about a new heaven and a new earth. It speaks of Jesus coming back, the one who lived historically 2,000 years ago and who died historically 2,000 years ago. And George Parks, a scientist and a man of logic, believed was raised to life again 2,000 years ago and who ascended to heaven is coming back, and there is going to be a new heaven and a new earth. Folks, we need to be really careful that we don't get caught into a caricature of the future life of heaven, of clouds and harps. That's not what the Bible teaches. That's a, an almost Disney-like uh, fiction. What the Bible speaks about, yes, is that George is present with his Lord and Savior, but there is a day coming when his body will rise as Jesus comes back, and where there will be a new heaven and a new earth. Now, the Bible doesn't tell us much about it. I'm not quite sure what George's role in that will be, because there won't be any disease. But maybe his engineering will come back into, in, into importance. Maybe his, his brilliance as a scientist, a man curious, a man of faith, a man of Jesus, because there's a future coming that George looked forward to that inspired him and allowed him to look forward with hope and certainty. And so the one who was raised from the dead is the one in whom we trust today in sure and certain hope of resurrection. Folks, you know and knew George Parks. You knew his integrity. You knew his intelligence. You knew his faith. If you don't know his Lord and Savior, then can I encourage you to reflect and think about that? Because his hope was clear. And I don't know whether yours is. So if you want to know more about that, then please do speak to some of us, and we would love to introduce you to the Lord that George knew. A man of authenticity, a man of example, a man of faith. And so in this service of thanksgiving, we thank God for George, for his work produced by faith, his labor prompted by love, and his endurance inspired by hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. Let me pray briefly, and then we are, I'm going to ask you to stand as we sing our next hymn. Father God, we pray blessing on this family at this difficult time, but we give thanks for George, and we give thanks for all that he meant to us, and indeed for all his work and his endurance prompted by hope. We pray that you might bless us as we close towards this service. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand together as we sing.
the hymn, I cast my mind to Calvary, O oh, praise the name. Thank you. Let's stand. folks you can all be seated in a few minutes I'm going to ask um, Desi just to come up uh, and to close in prayer but I have some important things um, first to say um, the family are so appreciative of so many who have supported them over the last few months during George's recent illness so I just want to name some of those people we cannot name them all of course but the ambulance service who responded so promptly on the day that George took ill to Dr. Alexandra and her team at the Acute Stroke Ward in Level 6 at the Royal Victoria Hospital. 
Dr. Alcorn and the rehabilitation team at the Lagan Valley Hospital in Ward 14. Also for Jane Moore and all of the staff at Faith House who cared so well for George over the last few weeks. And all of those who visited, sent messages and cards and prayed throughout George's illness. Also the family would like to thank the team here at Bethany who have helped to coordinate our service today. And you can see that a significant amount of effort went into that. And so a big thank you on behalf of the, the family. Now this is important. There's refreshments available and there's more than enough for everybody. So I'm going to encourage everybody just to stay if you can. We appreciate it if you can't, but some have traveled a large distance and we appreciate your time with us this afternoon. So we're going to encourage you to stay for refreshments. Now the refreshments are served in the Bethany Center around the corner. It's only a few minutes walk around the corner. Just follow everybody else. It's hopefully stopped raining. And if it hasn't, there'll be umbrellas aplenty, I'm sure, and you can share them. But I'm really going to encourage everyone, if you can possibly stay, please do that. And I think the family will go out and down to the Bethany Centre. Otherwise, the place will be quite congested. You'll appreciate with all the rooms full, it's not possible for them just to, to greet people here. So again, another reason for you to go to the Bethany Centre and enjoy some tea and refreshments down there. Now, Nobody's a stranger. Don't feel strange to anybody. Just tap them on the shoulder and just say, how did you know, George? Thank you for attending with us today. We really appreciate this. And our prayers again with the family. But I'm just going to ask Desi Maxwell just to close in prayer. Thank you, Desi. Elizabeth, that man in the gospel said four friends who opened a hole in the roof at least figuratively, I trust today you'll have a deep sense in the whole family that you've more than four friends who are opening a hole in the roof for you. Very much so, as you've touched the lives of so many. And week by week, I used to see you and George on a Thursday sitting down and it's a mark of the man. He came even to novices to sit at their feet and was keen to learn. And you often heard me quote from a man called Abraham Heschel. And I turn to Heschel now, a Jewish thinker of the last century, but a man of immense godliness, where he once wrote, the doctor is not only a healer of disease, he is also a source of emanation of the spirit of concern and compassion. The doctor may be a saint without knowing it, and certainly without pretending to be one. There's been no pretense, obviously, about George, and indeed Elizabeth, and about the family. You've had this, I'm sure, like me, this great sense God has been with us today. Truly, it's to his glory. Let's pray together. Lord, we bow our heads before the one who has been raised from the dead, as Ian has just pointed to us so, so graphically, and George pointed us to through his life. We're amazed now that we speak to you as one who is in heaven who hasn't forgotten what it's like to be one of us. And if we ever forgot what you were like in the days of your flesh, we got a very vivid picture of your identification with humanity in the figure of George his bedside manner and his life were in perfect harmony. Goodness, we can have no doubt about that today. His life showed that service of his Lord and Creator and Saviour were not <coughs> incompatible with science. Goodness, it was all done to your glory. His professionalism was never at odds with his such clear humility. 
and at the top of his professional ladder, with those accolades that he'd won and deserved, and deservedly are recognized, he never forgot his humble beginnings, his humble spirit. Lord, what can we do but from the bottom of our hearts, thank you. Thank you that you are here. You are here with us. And we are only here because we have seen you and your love, your greatness, your compassion. We've seen so much reflected in George and indeed continuing to be reflected in his family. To that great God, we simply raise our hymn of praise. And we come, yes, looking back with the richest of memories, but looking forward with the greatest of hopes. Thank you on this day of rest as you restore us and as you work in our lives that we will have that sense of vibrancy and love and greatness of our God. And that that great physician who walked the streets of ancient Israel, ancient Galilee, that great physician who raised, was raised from the dead and who looked upon people with compassion, that great comp uh, physician whom George followed, may the spirit of that physician go with us from this building and may we carry with us every rich memory of that man who made such an impact and was such a reflection of you and what you've done. Go with us from here in your spirit, covering us with your love. To you be all the glory. Amen. Okay, and maybe just uh, just uh, logistics. If the family maybe are allowed to leave down towards the Bethany Centre, and then as soon as they're they're gone, then everybody else is free to go to get refreshments, not home. <laughs> Thank you.